Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanities. Cardiology. Computer. Yeah. Public health. Global. Science. Communication. Hi everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell and this month a step forward in tracing the progress of HIV in Africa thanks to a simple affordable new test. We'll tell you more. And also we'll hear about a book that could literally be infectious reading. It's about pathogens and the message is basically that nature wants all of us dead. Also, how could the NHS save millions of pounds a year? For 10 years, we spent maybe 600 million pounds that we didn't need to, and now we're spending only 5 million pounds a year. So there's a huge saving, and we could use that money to pay nurses and other staff to look after patients. The Imperial College Podcast. Well, let's jump straight in. And of course, COP26 has finally drawn to a close after I think it's fair to say uh, an eventful and dramatic even uh, few weeks in Glasgow. There was an Imperial College delegation there. And to kind of get her take on that, we have Kat Peterson joining us now. She's campaign manager with the Grantham Institute at Imperial. What would you say then, and you in the team, what did you make of what happened at COP? So I think there's plenty to say about what happened at COP. The summit played an important role and there was progress in terms of, you know, advancing the goal of halting climate change. And in other ways, I think it would be fair to say that it definitely fell short. There's been definite steps of progress at Glasgow. Many of my colleagues have highlighted we've really seen some progress, especially on some of the very tricky technical aspects of what's called the Paris Agreement rulebook. So that's things like carbon trading across borders, frameworks for sort of transparency of how countries report their emissions. Those things have taken years of negotiation. And so it's a real step forward that we finally have agreement on some of those things. And that wasn't necessarily a given before COP, so we really should recognise that process. But I think it's important to say that at the same time as those bits of progress, we are we are still not on track to deliver on the Paris Agreement goal of keeping warming to below 1.5 degrees. And it is absolutely critical that we do everything we can to stay within that. Countries have been making lots of pledges, both short term and long term. And post COP calculations and scientists are saying that that now would put us on track to below two degrees of warming, which is obviously great. That's with the massive caveat that it's only if all those pledges and targets are actually implemented. And so I think implementation is absolutely the name of the game currently. And, and, and everyone would agree on that. But again, five years ago, we were looking at more than three degrees of, of projected warming based on pledges and targets. So Again, absolutely positive steps following COP26. But finally, I would just say that, you know, we know the atmosphere and the climate doesn't respond to pledges and to targets. It responds to actual things that reduce emissions and on the short term plans. So what countries plan to do within the next decade, we are still looking at uh, 2.4 degrees of warming. That would be catastrophic for people and for nature. We really need action to to reduce that. The, the final agreement at Glasgow did include plans for countries to come back next year and update their targets. And that's a really important recognition of the shortfall. But we're still far from where we need to be. And similarly, on conversations around finance in terms of dealing with the impacts of climate change, lots of developing countries are not happy with the support that, that they were given um, at COP26. So there's absolutely loads to be getting on, on with still um, following the summit. All right. And so what were the Imperial team doing there then? Uh, Well, we had about 25 people going, academic experts, PhD students, comms professionals, all there to kind of observe the negotiations, talk to the media about what was going on, you know, help people make sense of of all the very technical conversations that were happening. Also just meet with, you know, colleagues, other researchers, government and business representatives and, and so on. Their delegation also hosted and attended lots of different events, a UK Science Pavilion event organised by the Grantham Institute and the Met Office, which focused on how science can support policy design to you know, achieve net zero emissions. We had an official UN side events on the link between uh, biodiversity and climate change, with a particular focus on South America and sort of engaging um, indigenous communities in the solutions. And then events on climate innovation and how people can make use of that at home, an event between the Grantham Institute and the Imperial Institute for Global Health Innovation, on links between climate change and mental health. And then of course, people involved in lots of different panels as well, really emphasizing the importance of science for the COP26 negotiations. And I will say that that was a really positive in- outcome that a lot of the final agreement texts really sort of emphasize how important it is to listen to the science and the urgency of acting on climate change. So we were really happy to kind of see that emphasis as well and uh, played, a, I would say a role in, in highlighting that during the negotiations as well. 
Great. All right. Well, Kat Peterson at the Grantham Institute, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, also here is Caroline Brogan. And Caroline, you're going to be talking about these rather controversial measures to identify illegal material online. Tell me more about this. Hi, Gareth. Yeah, so back in August, Apple announced that they would scan all their devices, so that's phones, tablets, laptops, for illegal images like, for example, child sex abuse material. This would work by comparing all images on a device with known illegal images using signatures so that the algorithm would be able to pick up, you know, and match. This is a legal image that matches what we already know to be illegal. This would then report it to the authorities. However, Apple withdrew their proposal due to privacy and surveillance concerns. But Imperial researchers have now considered another facet. How well might these scanners actually work in practice? And what have they found? So the Department of Computing's Dr. Eve Alexander de Montjoy and his team found that by applying a simple filter to images that they had tagged as illegal meant that they went undetected by these scanners. This is something called hashing and it means that while the image looks the same to the human eye, it looks completely different to a computer. They tested five algorithms that were similar to Apple's and were able to fly 99% of so-called illegal images under the radar of the algorithms. Well, there must be implications for this, especially in terms of policy and uh, implementation. Yeah, so this raises quite obvious questions about just how proportional an intervention like this could be when the algorithm can be so easily fooled, as the researchers say. While tackling child abuse is rightly a priority, the danger is seeing this as a magic bullet and accepting what is essentially surveillance in return for a system that isn't actually fit for purpose. All right, Caroline, um, serious questions raised there. Thank you very much indeed. That's Caroline Brogan, and we also heard from Kat Peterson. Well, now, a promising development in tackling HIV. Researchers at Imperial are working on a simple, affordable test for the amount of virus that someone with HIV has in their body. It's an assay that shows up the viral load and the strain of the virus. The test is about to be trialled, and ultimately it could help monitor the progress of the disease in Africa, where drug resistance is an ongoing problem. Hayley Dunning has been finding out more from Dr Catherine Chibirige, a postdoctoral research associate in the Human Immunology Lab at Imperial. The availability of crestline generic drugs has really increased the availability of treatment and there's now factories in Africa that actually manufacture a lot of the first line drugs. But unfortunately, a lot of people aren't monitoring this treatment. So... Um, they're not catching when they develop resistance and then they're spreading drug resistant strains or children who are born to mothers who have drug resistant strains are also being born with drug resistant strains. So it's caused a big surge in drug resistance development. So your innovation is designed to help with this issue. What does it do? Right. So we have a, it's a laboratory developed assay or an LDA for HIV nucleic acids. So it's a PCR polymerase chain reaction that quantifies HIV, RNA, or DNA within samples. It's fairly simple, but we've actually validated it according to international guidelines for developing viral load tests. And we've designed it so that it picks up a broad variety of different strains. So HIV is highly variable, and uh, that's one of the big challenges is because it mutates so much, it's hard to find regions that are similar across all the different strains that you can use as targets. But we've been very successful just because of our experience working with international samples and identifying a region that picked up all the strains in our repository. So I work with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and we have field sites in um, South Africa, Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia. What this test does then, I understand, is it detects sort of the viral load in a patient, so how much virus they have and what kind of virus it is. So why is it important to know that? Viral load is one of the key ways that we monitor treatment. When people are on successful treatment, their virus becomes undetectable in the plasma. So it goes down tens of thousands of copies in the blood to less than 20 copies per mil. But the methods to do that and the techniques, you require highly skilled staff and you require specialized equipment and you buy these kits from companies that are 50 to 100 or more pounds per test. So we have this assay that you can run in the lab that comes to about four to 10 pounds per test and uh, does the same thing. 
And what we're actually doing that's a little bit different is we're evaluating the the use of cells. So at the moment, the standard monitoring, you measure HIV RNA in the plasma, but there's a lot of emerging literature that you can actually just measure the amount of HIV DNA in cells. And you'll detect the DNA in your peripheral cells even when it's undetectable in the plasma. So it's actually more sensitive and it's actually a better prognostic marker than the viral load. So it's better and cheaper. So what's the current status? We got some funding through the Postdoctoral and Fellows Development Centre Wings for Ideas program here at Imperial to lyophilize the reagents. Lyophilize is freeze drying. Basically, we use the same instrument or equipment you would use to freeze dry your fruit. Um, one of the challenges in, in Africa, particularly in more resource limited settings, is that they don't necessarily have reliable refrigeration. Even in the shipping, if things are held up at customs or in the airport for a prolonged time, sometimes they'll end up at the wrong temperature for a long time. When I worked out in Africa, that was one of our big challenges, was just getting kits in, delays in shipping. They'd expire or we'd break the cold chain, so by the time they got to the lab, we couldn't use them. So with the lyophilized reagents, we kind of circumvent that, and they have a much longer shelf life, so it means you could take it out to a field clinic somewhere remote, and they'd still be able to use it. So we want to develop a kit that's actually ambient temperature and has a prolonged shelf life and use that in our efficacy trials in in Africa. Brilliant. So you mentioned field trials. Is that the next step of the project? Yes. So that's the next step before we can confidently say that, you know, this is actually good for treatment monitoring. This works as well as or better than your commercial viral load test. We need to do a neck on neck comparison. And uh, so we can say, you know, this will have utility in resource limited settings. We do need to be able to train personnel, get them to use it and actually show that they're able to use it effectively there. Another down the line possibility is commercialization. So one of the big things I think, especially once I have a prototype, will be starting pitching the kit or the idea to possible investors. We don't have the capacity within ourselves to disseminate it widely. I mean, we'll publish it and anyone with the right background would be able to recapitulate it in their labs. But I think one of the main ways that we'll be able to have it disseminated widely is we get somebody who's willing to develop it and distribute it and commercialize it, but hopefully still keep it affordable. That's going to be one of the next key challenges and key steps. Catherine Jabirige talking to Hayley Dunning. Well, now, a book whose main message is that nature is out to kill us all is always going to grab your attention. And so it is with Infectious, the new book by Dr John Tregoning of Imperial's Faculty of Medicine. It has stories of scabs, pustules and parasitic worms. But it's not all gross stuff. There are stories, for instance, of the unsung scientists whose work has saved lives all over the world. Ryan O'Hare has been speaking to John about pathogens and how we fight them. The book makes much of the team endeavour of science. But Ryan did wonder if there are any names in particular that stand out. Yeah, I think the most important person who possibly people haven't heard of is a scientist called Maurice Hillman, who worked as a vaccinologist in the States at, at Merck in the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s. And he developed 40 different vaccines during his career, um, eight of which we still use today and are used kind of very widely globally to protect children from diseases. And his impact and his kind of legacy of saving people from death and disease is enormous. And yet it's often kind of unknown. Is there a single advance or or breakthrough or pinnacle moment that you think stands out uh, from the whole history of, of infectious disease? To me, one of the most staggering things is the change in HIV treatment. I'm in my mid 40s and I remember HIV emerging in the 80s. It was this terrifying disease that was killing people aggressively. It was sort of untreatably and it was seen as this sort of death sentence. And then from there, they, the drugs were developed and in part that was work done by people at Imperial into kind of testing these drugs combinations has led to a treatment which leads to a long, chronic, stable condition. And it just, in the space of my lifetime, to go from something that, that was definitely going to kill you to kind of could be managed um, with access to drugs is, is an incredible change. And and I guess the other one is the is the speed of the COVID vaccines. I think we... It's mind blowing that we went from, you know, January last year with an, a basically unknown pathogen. We're all beginning to think, oh, this could be bad to a sequence, to a vaccine, 
to a rollout within less than a year with technologies that were new and relatively untested in kinds of this, this scale. So that kind of speed of development has been amazing. And it is, it's kind of the tip of the spear. It, it's 20 years work went into this one year of accelerated development. But it just seeing that kind of this thing happen within my kind of research career is also really exciting. Uh, you, you mentioned vaccines there, which is one of the most timely subjects we could discuss at the moment. What do you think the public gets wrong about vaccines that we really shouldn't? And the most important thing that we, we get wrong? I think the biggest challenge with vaccines is they are a preventative drug. So you are taking something to prevent something that you may never get. So it's 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 not dissimilar to wearing a car seatbelt. You know, you wear it and most of the time you don't need it. And I think as diseases get rarer and rarer, so I, you know, I've never seen anyone get measles or mumps or rubella or whooping cough. You know, there's huge numbers of things that we don't see. And then it becomes very hard to then equate the risk of that very nasty disease. Measles is a catastrophically nasty disease. It has long-term disability impact uh, on people who get it. But because we don't see it, then the kind of perceived risk of the vaccine gets much bigger than the actual risk of the disease. So it's that kind of cost benefit. And it's very hard to do if you're not being exposed to the diseases. In countries where disease prevalence is much higher, vaccine uptake is much higher because the immediate benefit is seen. Now, obviously, the, the book covers a lot of ground, as we said, uh, including some of the those pioneers of infectious disease. One of my own favourites was Lady Montague, who forms a long line of people who helped us to eradicate smallpox by blowing scabs up people's noses. So it's that wonderful mix of being ingenious and absolutely disgusting at the same time. Did you come across like a, a favourite of yours that was that will stay in your head after writing this book? Yeah, so there was a, a, a microbiologist, he was a French-Canadian called Félix de Arel, I'm probably pronouncing that slightly wrong. His scientific breakthrough was to demonstrate that there were viruses that could actually infect bacteria. So we think of bacteria as being infectious, but actually there are things that live on top of the bacteria and can kill them, these viruses called bacteriophage. So he was one of the first people to demonstrate that. But he was doing that in the context of the 1920s and 1930s, when there was this huge kind of global political change. And he, in, in his personal career, he lived in Russia for a bit. His scientific mentor at the time was having an affair with the head of the Russian secret police. He got in trouble with them. He then was arrested by the Wehrmacht, the German army, during the 1940s. He set up a failed chocolate factory. And he also got in a scientific duel with another scientist over who actually identified the bacteriophage in the first place. So it's just a sort of crazy, colourful life on top of like an important scientific discovery as well. And just to clarify a point there, when you say scientific duel, do you mean through the journals or do you mean in person with pistols? I, I don't think it actually moved as far as in person pistols, but he, he did write into a scientific journal and challenged another man to a duel. So it, it's, it's something that I maybe we should be bringing back. Pipettes at dawn. <laughs> I'd pay good money to see that. Infectious by John Tregoning is published by Hardman and Swainson and it's out now. He was speaking there to Ryan O'Hare. Well, finally, the NHS could save millions of pounds a year, money that could be paying for doctors and nurses if it produced certain off-patent drugs like insulin itself. So argues Kareem Mirren, a professor of endocrinology at Imperial. He's started a petition to Parliament to argue for a national drug manufacturer within the NHS. The petition has so far attracted nearly 9,000 signatures. If it gets to 10,000, the government will be obliged to respond. Kareem is trying to banish the unethical practice of price gouging, where some manufacturers engineer the market to maximise profit. Emily Head has been hearing more from Professor Mirren. Price gouging is where a supplier of anything deliberately restricts the supply and then exponentially puts the price up out of the reach of many people. Now, of course, in some businesses that might be appropriate, but for drugs that may be essential for survival for some people, that is quite unethical. So how exactly does that happen with medicines? At the moment, we rely on private enterprise and industry to make all of the drugs in the UK. And they do a very good job in most instances. But there are some very cheap drugs that are almost not worthwhile. If there's a profit motive, there's no profit in cheap drugs. 
So for example, hydrocortisone is very cheap to make, and if it's sold at cost price, the companies that make it might feel that it's not worth their while, and so they pull out of the market, which is what caused the problem in the first place. So for those drugs that are not worth the while of industry to make, the NHS should make them. Can you tell me about the first time you saw price gouging, and then how your research into it's led to this petition? I discovered that this was happening really because of one of the drugs that patients that I treat use a lot. Uh, that was a drug called hydrocortisone, which is, a, which is an essential drug for many people. And it's been very cheap for many years. And then the price started going up. When, in 2014, the price had gone up from about a pound a month to £140 a month, I then started undertaking a lot of research looking at alternatives. So what we did was we started a randomised control trial to compare hydrocortisone and prednisolone. I then found a company in West London who agreed to make placebo and hydrocortisone and prednisolone for us to study. And then we applied to the MHRA for a licence, which we obtained, and we started doing this trial. And then about halfway through, in about 2017, I asked the company, could you just launch it on the open market and see what happens? And they did, and the price came crashing down from £150 a month to it's now about £3 a month. So then I thought, what we need to do, of course, is make these drugs ourselves within the NHS so that we won't have this problem of price gouging where people unethically put the price up. And that's what led to your petition. So what exactly are you asking for in that? Now, at the moment, we need a petition because the current mechanism for drug manufacture and sale is through private enterprise to make it. So I'm asking the government to allow us or even support a entity within the NHS that makes drugs in competition with private industry, but only for drugs that are generic and cheap to make and not under patent. And how might that benefit the NHS? The NHS currently can't afford some of the prices. So for hydrocortisone, we, the NHS was spending £60 million a year, and that money should have been used for patient care. And for 10 years, we spent maybe £600 million that we didn't need to, and now the price has come down, so we're spending only £5 million a year. So there's a huge saving, and we could use that money to pay nurses and other staff to look after patients, which is what the NHS should be doing. And so, finally, what would a world without price gouging look like, in your opinion? A world without price gouging. So that would be a very ethical world. And that would be a world where people put healthcare ahead of personal private profit. Now, private profit drives a lot of good things, drives a lot of discovering new things. But I'm not talking about new things. I'm talking about things that should be cheap and easily available. And income is very important. But if price gouging drives the profit motive as the main driver, then we have a problem. So without that, we'd have a much more fair society and we'd have a much more equitable distribution of drugs that people really need. Kareem Miran talking to Emily Head. And if you'd like to check out that petition and sign it, you can find details on our podcast web pages. You can search online or follow the links from Be Inspired from the Imperial homepage. And that's it for this edition. Don't forget there's lots of ways that you can get hold of this podcast via all your favourite pod platforms, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud. We're everywhere, really. All right, well, I'm Gareth Mitchell saying a fond farewell for now, and I'll be back next time. See you then. Bye-bye.